Hello everyone, happy evening, a very good evening. I hope and I believe all of you are doing well. Uh, a quick note whether the audio visual is all good. Waiting to see the live chat might seem some issue. Am I audible and visible? Yes, that's great. I think there was some problem with my phone. I could not see the live chat. Okay. So long time, no see. I mean, it's been very, very long that we have had a YouTube live session on our channel. So apologies for that. But uh, today we are going to have some um, very, very conceptual MCQs that we are going to discuss. These are mixed bag MCQs because I think a lot of the syllabus is what we have done following the daily targets on the Telegram group. So this is going to be a revision integration of whatever you have learned. And all these points, you know, whatever we are discussing in the sessions is definitely going to help you for the exams. So if possible, try to note it down as well, uh, maybe as the bullet points so that you can revise it later. Okay, so uh, let's start with the first question here. This is the first question. We have some lengthy MCQs, clinical MCQs today. So please read the question and uh, tell me what do you think is the answer to this one? Okay, NF100, definitely I want to resume just that now I'm falling short of the topics that I should be taking. So if you have any suggestions for NF100, what other topics that we should be taking, uh, please let me know so that I can take that in the upcoming uh, sessions. Okay, so I see some answers coming in. So, you know, these are some basic concepts uh, asked in a tricky way. That might be something that we might have missed while uh, reading. I see majority of the students answering as uh, D, but no, it's not D. Okay, so lengthy questions. Uh, read the last two lines first to save time. That's a very, very important trick, right? So the question is, which of the following best describes the mechanism of action of the medication that the patient received? And the second last line tells you that the patient is diagnosed with panic disorder. So the diagnosis has been given. She receives medication and she feels better within an hour. So uh, diagnosis has been made with panic disorder. She received the drug. After that, she feels better. So what is the drug that we are talking about here? So who's got it right the first? Basically, option C is correct. Rekha has got it right the first. I can see very good Rekha Jaiswal. Uh, what is the drug that the patient has received? So in panic disorder, acute conditions, we give benzodiazepines because they give quick relief. Okay, so the drug is benzodiazepines. So what is the mechanism of action of benzodiazepines? We all know based on the options also that it's somewhere related to the GABA receptor. And what GABA receptor is it? Is it GABA A or is it GABA B? It is GABA A. Okay, so, uh, so the drug here basically is benzodiazepines which act at the GABA A receptor. Which drug acts as GABA B? 
Which drug acts at GABA B receptor? Remember B four B. That is baclofen. Okay, that is baclofen. Basically used as muscle relaxant as well. GABA A P A acts at the benzodiazepine, and remember it does not bind at the GABA binding site. Okay, it basically causes allosteric modulation. Allo means different, steric means site. So it binds at a different site as compared to the GABA site. So let's say if this is the GABA A receptor, this is where the GABA binds. Benzodiazepine will bind at different site as compared to GABA. Okay. So what allosteric modulation do they do? Positive or negative? It is positive allosteric modulation. Positive means they increase the action of GABA. So basically, what do benzodiazepines do is? they increase the frequency of chloride channel opening okay the chloride channel opening increases it increases the duration nahi it increases the frequency of the chloride channel opening barbiturates increase the duration so what happens because of the increased chloride influx basically there is hyperpolarization and because of the hyperpolarization the negative it is difficult to excite the uh, you know the neuron so that is why basically there is inhibition that is suppression of the cns okay so basically benzodiazepines are positive allosteric modulators at a site different than gaba they increase the frequency of the chloride channel opening so affects the g protein signal transduction no it is the chloride channel basically by which it is acting the g protein coupled receptor is basically gaba b which is baclofen alters the gaba metabolism it is not doing anything to gaba metabolism can you give me an example of a drug which alters the gaba metabolism anti epileptic drug i'll give you the clues it is anti epileptic drug it causes visual disturbances it is vigabatrin right it is vigabatrin visual disturbances gaba transaminase inhibitor it inhibits gaba transaminase that increases the gaba levels binds allosterically to the gaba receptor yes that's the correct one competes with gaba no it does not compete with gaba physically blocks the ion channel lumen no drugs like amiloride wagera these act by uh, you know uh, blocking the ion channel lumen so everybody is clear with this that why the answer is this one an important concept in pharmacology that we might have missed reading that it causes allosteric modulation and it is positive modulation right it increases the effect of gaba next question now integrating this basically with biochemistry can you tell me that gaba comes from which amino acid gaba comes from which amino acid and which reaction is it that's the next question gaba is derived from which amino acid and what reaction and what vitamin do we require here very good it is glutamate that is glutamic acid right glutamate glutamic acid that is gaba okay gaba remember g4g it is glutamic acid which is the reaction that is taking place what is the reaction that is taking place is it carboxylation is it methylation is it hydroxylation which reaction is it it is glutamate glutamic acid ka decarboxylation this is a previously asked question it is decarboxylation and for decarboxylation which vitamin is required for decarboxylation which vitamin is required it is vitamin b6 okay it is vitamin b6 remember it's decarboxylation not deamination it's decarboxylation that's the reason one of the recent inict questions uh, neonatal seizures okay what vitamin supplementation do we give in neonatal seizures we give vitamin b6 supplementation why because it is required for gaba synthesis right in seizures basically it's the excitation we want to balance it with the inhibitory neurotransmitter so increase the gaba you give vitamin b6 okay that's the reason and we know that b6 is a coenzyme for decarboxylation reaction okay so this is how you integrate with the other subjects as well 
Okay, so look at this image here. Basically, this is the GABA A receptor. You have the GABA binding site here. You have the benzodiazepine bi binding site here. These are two different sites. That means it is allosteric modulation. It is increasing the chloride channel opening frequency. Okay, it increases the chloride channel opening. Okay, so remember benzodiazepines are positive allosteric modulators at GABA A, not negative. They are increasing the GABA ka effect. Okay, let's go to the next question. Comparatively easy one. Let's see who gets it right the first. The last question, Rekha Jaswal was the one to get it right the first. Let's see this one. Am I able to see the live chat? Okay, now I get the answers. Okay, very good. So, who got it right the first? I can see Vibha. And almost everybody has got it right. First to get it right is Vibha. Okay, that's great. So, what's the diagnosis here? This is comparatively easy one. So, we have the decimates, uh, you know, in the decimates membrane, the deposition of copper that is called as KF ring. Okay, the, op uh, the description here, chronic hepatitis with corneal changes, that is the KF ring, which is deposition of copper in the decimates membrane, right? So, the diagnosis here is Wilson's disease. Okay, it is Wilson's disease. What happens in Wilson's disease basically? What is the problem? The problem is with ceruloplasmin. Okay, the synthesis and secretion of ceruloplasmin. So, ceruloplasmin is decreased. So, copper binding, ceruloplasmin binds the copper. Copper does not bind. So, there is increased free copper which is excreted in the urine. Okay, this has been asked many times in FMG exam also. Ceruloplasmin is decreased in the urine. Copper is increased. That is what happens in Wilson's. Now, uh, copper which is there, basically it has a pro-oxidant effect, free radical injury. It damages the liver, leads to hepatitis, comes out into the circulation, goes to the brain and also to the cornea. In the brain, it gets deposited in the basal ganglia as well and it causes basal ganglia atrophy. What sign do we see in the uh, MRI in Wilson's disease? What sign do we see in MRI in Wilson's disease? Anyone? We have learned this in our radiology classes. In Wilson's disease, what is the MRI brain may sign? Wilson, remember, Wilson has face like giant panda. Okay, so that is face of giant panda sign. Okay, the face of giant panda sign. Which affects what part of the brain? That is the midbrain. Okay, that is the midbrain. So, right, Wilson's is also called as hepatolenticular degeneration. So, as the term says, it affects the liver. Lenticular means the lentiform nucleus as well. So, the basal ganglia are affected. Okay. If I ask you what is the inheritance pattern of Wilson's disease? It is autosomal recessive. What is the chromosome number? Anyone? What's the chromosome number for Wilson's? Same like retinoblastoma, that is chromosome number 13. Okay, that is chromosome number 13. What is the gene for Wilson's disease? Gene is ATP 7A or 7B. It is ATP 7B. Remember, will son. Okay, when I say will son, son matlab beta. So that is ATP 7B. ATP 7A is another copper wala disorder. That is Menke's disease. Okay, that is Menke's disease. So, remember it is ATP7B. If I ask you what is the gold standard investigation for Wilson's? What is the gold standard investigation for Wilson's? 
is it the serum cellulose is it the urine copper levels or something else okay the gold standard is liver biopsy okay the gold standard investigation is liver biopsy what do we use in treatment basically the copper chelating agents because the copper is in excess right so look at this one serum ceruloplasmin is decreased urine copper is high gold standard is liver biopsy treatment what drugs do we use in treatment of wilson's if there is no decompensation then we use zinc if there is decompensation then we add trientine also right so especially there's decompensation there is neurologic manifestations we use trientine plus zinc or for neurologic we also have tetrathiomolybdate if it is severe decompensation we have no option but to do a liver transplant so remember we have zinc and we have trientine if it is with decompensation along with neurologic manifestations okay tetrathiomolybdate is also for neurologic manifestations all right so that was about wilson's look at the mri okay the black bone tells you that this is mri look at the appearance here that is the face of giant panda sign okay look at the midbrain so you have this part what is this black part this is the red nucleus okay that's the red nucleus periaqueductal uh, matter and the substantia nigra basically these are black the rest of the midbrain is white that gives the face of giant panda sign okay that gives the face of giant panda sign and this is where you see the basal ganglia they are showing hyper intensity because of the copper deposition right the lentiform nucleus putamen showing the showing the copper deposition the hyper intensity decompensation basically means the liver failure okay the hepatic decompensation okay so if it's a severe decompensation then we have no option but to do a liver transplant okay if it's neurologic remember trientine n e n e neurologic may we add okay so tetrathiomolybdate or trientine uh, penicillamine was used previously now the drug of choice is zinc penicillamine is also a copper chelator but now we do not use that okay all right coming to the rest of the options can you tell me uh, which condition can cause diabetes mellitus specifically if i ask you it is also called as bronze diabetes because there is hyperpigmentation and there is diabetes pancreas is affected that is hemochromatosis okay that is hemochromatosis pulmonary emphysema which liver condition like which condition affects the liver also and it causes pulmonary emphysema also that is alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency right alpha 1 anti trypsin deficiency theek hai so remember these important points going to the next question now okay this is the next question an interesting one again tell me what do you think is the answer to this one i hope i'm able to see the comments let's see who gets it right the first before that we had rekha and vibha okay so who has got it right the first is aditya okay aditya mohanty and the correct answer here is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia why let's have a look at the question lengthy question last line initiation of this therapy increases this patient's risk for which of the following which therapy second last line dofetilide therapy what is the condition paroxysmal atrial fibrillation so basically the question is that in a patient of afib when you are giving dofetilide what does it increase the risk of you know the patient is at increased risk for developing which of the following so the patient is at risk for developing polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that is basically torsidus d pointis 
Why torsades D pointers with do feet are light? Why do feet are light? It belongs to which antiarrhythmic class? Is it class 1, class 2 or class 3? It is class 3 antiarrhythmic drug. Right. What is the mnemonic for a class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs? It is AIDS. Okay. It is AIDS. What does AIDS stand for? Amiodarone, ibutilide, dofetilide and sotalol. Okay. It is class 3. So, which antiarrhythmic class increase the torsidus D pointers car risk? Can you tell me which classes increase the torsidus D pointers car risk? One is torsidus T for 3. Okay, remember T for 3. That is T and 3 rhyming class 3. And which is the other one? It is class 1A. Okay, it is class 1A. So, when you write torsidus D pointers is basically QT prolongation. So, when you read this QT ulta, remember T is like 1 and Q co you can form like A. Okay, Q has A in it. So, remember it is class 1A. So, remember class 1A and class 3 drugs, they cause increased risk of torsidus D pointers. What is the example of class 1A drugs? What is the mnemonic for class 1A antiarrhythmic drugs? Queen proclaimed two pyramids. Okay, queen proclaimed two pyramids. Imagine the queen of Egypt who proclaimed two pyramids. So, quinidine, procanamide and you have two pyramids that is disopyramide. Okay, so torsidus D pointers basically increase QT prolongation. When you give do fetalide, can you tell me why is there increased QT prolongation? This class 3 drug basically acts on which channels? Is it sodium? Is it calcium? Is it potassium? Class 1, class 2, class 3 and class 4. They act on which channels? See, class 1. 1 when I write N, it is sodium channels. Class 2, the second alphabet B, that is beta blockers. Class 3, when I say class 3, the three lines alphabet 1, 2, 3, it is potassium channel. Class 4, 4 is basically 3 plus 1, that is C plus A, that is calcium channel blocker. Okay, class 4 is calcium channel blocker. So, class 3 is basically potassium channel blocker. So, when you block the potassium, what happens? The repolarization becomes slow. Okay, the repolarization becomes slow. So, that increases the action potential duration. Whatever increases the action potential duration increases the QT interval, right? The QT prolongation it leads to. So, look at this basically. When you have slow repolarization, so look at the action potential duration. It is increasing. And this is where your QT basically is. The QT interval is increasing when you increase the action potential duration, right? So that's why you have QT prolongation that predisposes to torsidus D pointers. Which class 3 antiarrhythmic drug has minimum torsidus D pointers a risk? Which is the one which has minimum risk? It is amiodarone okay it is amiodarone which has the minimum risk out of all those it is amiodarone okay so look at this one that's basically your class 3 drugs they cause torsidus d pointers okay they have the risk of torsidus d pointers all right clear with everyone thyroid dysfunction thyroid dysfunction is a side effect with which uh, antiarrhythmic drug Thyroid dysfunction is a side effect with which antiarrhythmic drug? Right, thyroid basically iodine. So remember amiodarone. Okay, so it is iodine wala which has thyroid dysfunction. Visual disturbance, which antiarrhythmic drug can cause visual disturbance? It can cause xenthopsia, uh, GI disturbances, that is digoxin. Right, digoxin, it causes xenthopsia okay it causes visual disturbances bronchospasm can be a side effect with adenosine okay adenosine can cause bronchospasm av block will be a side effect with beta blockers calcium channel blockers 
we need to be careful in patients with AV block for before giving these drugs, right? So, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Clear with everyone? So, that was about this question. That was question number three. Let's go to the next question now. Again, another interesting conceptual question. Anyone. So, this is a topic that we have discussed that is um, Vigors diagram, the application of Vigors diagram. There's a uh, video there already on our channel. Please watch that. Okay, who has got it right the first? Uh, very good. Pragya has uh, got it right the first. The answer is C. Why C? Tell me what is the diagnosis here? The major keyword here is. Cardiac auscultation reveals a murmur that is best heard when the patient sits up and leans forward. What is the diagnosis? Which valvular condition is it? Murmur that is best heard when the patient sits up and leans forward. Which murmur? Absolutely right. That is aortic regurgitation. Okay, that is aortic regurgitation. So, now my question is what kind of murmur is aortic regurgitation? What murmur do we see in aortic regurgitation? So, you have the left ventricle, the blood going into the aorta, the aortic valve is not closing. That is why the blood comes back. When does the blood come back? In the diastole. What kind of murmur? early diastole okay that is early diastolic murmur why the murmur is early diastolic because the maximum pressure difference is in the early diastole right so it's a decrescendo type of murmur the intensity goes on decreasing because the pressure gradient between the aorta and the ventricle goes on decreasing so in the early diastole it has the maximum intensity so it's a decrescendo murmur Early diastolic decrescendo murmur, better heard on leaning forward and the patient sitting up. So, what is the defect here? Basically, the aortic valve is not closing. That's the reason that is regurgitation. So, when will we hear this murmur the best? Just after the point where the aortic valve should close. After that point, all the defect is starting. So, basically, the question is where is the point where the aortic valve actually should be closing? Have a look at the normal Vigors diagram. Okay. So, this is the point, the dichrotic notch. That's the key area which helps you identify aortic valve closure. Right. What's happening in aortic regurgitation? The dichrotic notch is lost because the aortic valve is not closing. So, there's no dichrotic notch. So, remember in aortic regurgitation, there would be no dichrotic notch. Just after the aortic valve closure, that is point C, the early diastole, that is where the intensity will be the maximum. This is the point where you see that the ventricle pressure is increasing. So, this is the systole, this is the maximum systolic pressure, the intensity that we have. And this is basically here you have the diastole. So, D is the mid diastolic point, here it would be mitral stenosis ka murmur. E is the point just before the systole. So, that is the point where you get pre-systolic accentuation of mitral stenosis murmur. At the point B, which is the maximum intensity, the systolic valve, that is the point where the aortic stenosis ka murmur will be maximum because it is during the flow, the maximum pressure when the intensity will be the maximum. Okay. So, aortic regurgitation will be early diastolic murmur and that is why the answer is C. 
what is the very very other important finding right which helps you to identify that the diagnosis here is aortic regurgitation even without reading the question if i tell you identify which valvular lesion is this it is the pulse pressure look at this aortic pressure ka graph look at the 140 150 around systolic look at the diastolic pressure okay look at the diastolic pressure that we have aortic pressure it is 50 so look at the pulse pressure okay the wide pulse pressure tells you that this is aortic regurgitation that gives all the clinical signs in aortic regurgitation right look at how the pressure is falling very fast as well okay look at the normal aortic uh, the pulse pressure basically 120 70 120 80 that's the pulse pressure here the pulse pressure is significant right so that tells you that this is aortic regurgitation is it clear with everyone how will you identify aortic regurgitation there's an entire video of vigors diagram and the pv loop in the valvular lesions please watch that video okay we have had it uh, in the one of the previous sessions okay all right let's go to the final question here question number five Very good, Pragya. So, I think the today's fast five, the winner is Pragya uh, because two questions, right, you got first. So, 43-year-old man, induction chemotherapy for AML and bronchoscopy may, uh, there is basically mold which is growing. So, induction chemotherapy and you see that uh, basically the patient has fever, 100.7 and the leukocyte count is just 900 with ANC of 100. So basically the patient has post chemotherapy there is febrile neutropenia. Okay there is febrile neutropenia. In such conditions aspergillus is a very very common uh, you know the fungus which is responsible. So the answer is aspergillus fumigatus and uh, aspergillus what would you see? What kind of branching do we have in aspergillus? When you write A, right, it is an acute angle. So, remember this important point. It is acute angle branching septate hyphae. Okay, it is septate hyphae with acute angle branching. Very, very important. What is the drug of choice here in invasive aspergillosis? A ka ulta aap kar do, that will become V. It will be Voriconazole. Okay, it would be Voriconazole. So, have a look at this table basically from Harrison's for the drug of choice. Voriconazole, if, if it's an invasive disease, we use Voriconazole. Okay, we use Voriconazole. Uh, again, where else do we use Voriconazole? Especially if it's a chronic pulmonary disease. If it's just an allergic, okay, the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, then we use itraconazole. Okay, otherwise we use itraconazole. If it's invasive, then we use voriconazole. For prophylaxis, we have posaconazole, itraconazole. If it's a single aspergilloma, that's a uh, that's basically a single fungal ball, then we do surgery. Okay, then we do surgery. Okay, is this uh, clear with everyone? So voriconazole is basically for invasive disease. What are the chest x-ray and the CT findings with aspergillus? One that you see here is the monod sign, right? Look at the monod sign in aspergilloma where you have this crescent of air. There is this fungal ball and you have the air crescent or the monod sign. What is this sign here? Look at the bronchi with the dense mucus within. This is called as finger in glove sign. Where do we see this finger in glove sign? Basically in ABPA. The increased mucus in the bronchus that gives this finger in glove sign. Okay, that's the finger in glove sign. Here also you see the finger in glove sign basically. And all these are the bronchi filled with the mucus. What sign are we seeing here in aspergillus? This is the halo sign what is the halo sign indicative of 
invasive aspergillosis it basically indicates the infarct surrounded by the hemorrhage okay so the center consolidation is the infarct the surrounding ground glass is the hemorrhage okay that is the halo sign seen in invasive aspergillosis okay that is seen in invasive aspergillosis and look at the aspergillus septate hyphae okay that is septate hyphae and the branching is going to be acute branching look at the mucor mucor how it is different from aspergillus it is aseptate and it has right angled branching okay remember it is aseptate broad hyphae and it is right angle branching with mucor okay remember this difference between aspergillus and mucor mycosis acute angle narrow septate hyphae is aspergillus okay very very important right so yes that completes our today's fast five mcqs i hope uh, you have enjoyed this and learned out of it the five important uh, concepts that we have learned today right so the first one one was benzodiazepines allosteric positive modulator then we had wilson's disease uh, right wilson's disease is what we spoke about which causes basal ganglia atrophy dofetalite class 3 increases torsidus depointis then we have aortic regurgitation early diastolic murmur wide pulse pressure and then we had the last one that is aspergillosis febrile neutropenia aspergillus infection is common right febrile neutropenia theek hai a reverse halo sign where do you see the reverse halo sign so reverse halo is the ulta right you have the white more white consolidation bahar and a ground glass in the center cryptogenic organizing pneumonia you can see in covid as well there are multiple causes of that theek hai thank you so much everyone for joining in stay tuned to this channel we'll be having a lot of sessions a lot of uh, videos coming up mnemonic of the day mcq of the day motivation for the day so stay tuned and do not forget to subscribe so that we stay connected and you do not miss on any important updates and sessions thank you so much and goodbye take care